over the last two weeks. Two major stories have had a very significant presence in the online world. From the UK emails that were leaked from a climate change research group here at home, reports continue to be leaked about the Afghan detainee controversy. These two things have been really big issues. To talk about how these stories uh, are playing out online and affecting the political world. Our own online journalist Katie O'Malley is here in Vancouver. Adrian McNair is here. He's a conservative blogger who writes the blog called Unambiguously Ambidextrous and in Toronto, a liberal blogger and the author of the blog BCer in Toronto, Jeff Jedris. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Evan. Uh, let's start with this no uh, climate gate thing. We had a guest on earlier who talked about these emails that were leaked in the UK about a group that it appears to, you know, show that, and I'll talk to these guys as well, to show that scientists were trying to spin climate change data in favor of, of climate change uh, activists. Adrian, what kind of impact is this having on the climate change story, especially, of course, as we head into Copenhagen? This is having just a tremendous uh, effect in the blogosphere, particularly among uh, conservative bloggers. They feel primarily that um, what you might call the mainstream media has uh, completely ignored the story for the past two weeks. Uh, they believe mainly because um, up till now it's been associated with uh, quote unquote deniers, sort of a pejorative which might be associated with people who don't believe. Um, that 9-11 was uh, perpetrated by terrorists. So right now it's just absolutely huge and they feel that it's been ignored up till now and they're very upset about that. Jeff, how is it playing out and how is the online world kind of driving the story? Well, certainly there's lots of, lots of activity, lots of talking about, uh, about these documents on the blogs, but I mean, I think the question to ask is how many of us have actually read all 3,000 pages of the documents? I, I can't say that I have, and I doubt most of the other bloggers who are uh, spending lots of time talking about this are. I think uh, what this is doing is it's giving those who are who don't believe necessarily in climate change some ammunition to support their view, and uh, those who who do believe in climate change, it's uh, it's uh, obviously isn't very positive. But right. I think uh, at the end of the day, most people will agree that climate change is real. It's it's happening, and. Uh, it's really just a fringe group that uh, really aren't on board with that position. Right. So, 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 Katie, I mean, it may be a fringe group. I'm not. Mm. We're not going to characterize that. But nonetheless, these have now got mainstream attention. But was it the online world that really has driven? I mean, there's 3,000 pages. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, this was the result of. Uh, it was actually directly driven by the online world in the sense that these emails were actually hacked from a computer using a network. And I think that for journalists. What does become the question when you're looking at a story like this is you actually do have to look at the context in which this material, because it's not like this material found its way into the public domain in a conventional fashion. It wasn't even that it was leaked. It's not like you can call this a whistleblower. It was taken from people who are probably not that thrilled about it and kind of put out there, which doesn't mean it's not a story, but it does mean that we as journalists have to kind of look at it and say, okay, what was the motivation here? What's about the timing? Why is it being put out right now? How is this being framed and shaped? And I think that might be what's you know, perturbing um, some bloggers and, and actually some columnists and, and some papers and, and some people who think that it's not getting the attention they deserve. But I think it is kind of important to look at the full story and that means looking at the context as to how this information came out as well as everything else. And, and, and Katie, when you see something with 3,000 mm. pages, uh, you know, mainstream media has limited time sometimes to get on a story, but on the online world, there's time to dig in and pull out stuff, right? Oh, absolutely, and that's why it's so, it, I think it's, in, in a sense, I probably wouldn't feel this way if it was what my email that was being sort of perused by the universe, but you do end up with a sort of distributed journalism, you know, whether it's professional or amateur, because people can go through it, they can take some time, they can break it into chunks, and they can look at it and analyze it and come up with their own analysis, and that, that's why making the material available widely is such a uh, which you can do on the internet, which you weren't able to do sort of with traditional press. It used to be all of our documents existed in sort of yellowed and dog-eared, you know, on the desk. Now they're all electronic and we can put them up immediately. Well, let's talk about the other story and that we've been seeing a lot of source documents. Speaking mm -hmm. of distributed journalism, lots of documents floating around in the online world about the Afghan detainee controversy. We have a CBC board. We've been collecting them on CBC. One site that's trying hard, obviously, to put these primary source material and make it available to the public is cbc.ca. Uh, and Katie, I'll start with you, but I want to move on to the other fellas here. What impact is this having, putting these documents up online? Well, I think it does have an impact because what it means is rather than rely on a reporter's interpretation or a one, you know, a minute 30 news clip 
or a 500 word article on what the documents say, people if they want to know can actually go and read them. And we're trying our best to present them in a format that makes them fairly uh, easy to navigate, although that presents some challenge when you're suddenly hit with a 130 page PDF, which right. is, you know, but it's, uh, I think, I'm really hoping to see more media outlets start to do this. We're trying to kind of get out there and, uh, and do what we can to encourage others to do the same and, you know, pull the documents, share them, make them available. Mm -hmm. Jeff, what's your view on that? Has this changed how this story is unfolded? Well, I, I think it's been great that all of this, uh, this uh, raw materials, this source material has been available. And I think uh, what it has done on the one sense is that uh, when, you, when you look actually at that page with all that information that's been blacked out, I mean, you can read on the paper, we can hear from you that, oh, it's page after page of blacked out material. But when you see it right there in black and white, so to speak, I mean, that it really, uh, really paints a picture. Right. And, uh, Adrian, what's your view? Are you saying, do you, do you, has this changed, the online world changed this story? Well, this is uh, just amazing to, to listen to, really, because, I mean, you have a, a wonderful journalist and a writer in, in Katie, and she's done such due diligence with the detainee affair. I wonder if she would have done as thorough a job uh, if she were directed to do so with the climate uh, scandal. And what's Can amazing that? is that she talks about there being too much information to, to disseminate with the climate, with the hacked uh, climate emails, but she's able to go through all of these detainee affairs. We talk about well, hold motivation. Actually, hey, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Let, me, let me respond to that. Yeah, go ahead, Katie. Okay, first of all, I didn't say there was too much material. I said it's, there, was, there used to be too much material to put it online because we just didn't have that vehicle. I think it's great that the climate change stuff is out there. Unfortunately, due to the provenance, if you are a journalist, you do have to take that into account. I'm not saying no cover it. I'm saying you got to look at the context and how it came forward as well. Yeah, and Adrian, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, are you saying that there's some kind of editorial direction here like, I mean that's that's an in interesting allegation it's frankly well, not a true one about the CBC well, but why it's are you not saying just, well it's not just an allegation when you think about the story you know Tiger Woods gets in a car accident and it's immediate news you have something that could be one of the greatest breaking stories of the 21st century and it gets reported two weeks after the fact we can discuss uh, ethics all we want the fact of the matter is, is that the um, you know quote unquote mainstream media felt very uncomfortable reporting the facts. It it gave all the bloggers two weeks uh, time to be able to do their own thorough research and investigative journalism that the media should have been doing in the first place. Yeah, uh, Katie, you can respond to that. I, I just want. I mean, I think everyone has an idea. You ask anyone what story they think the media really should be reporting, and they're not because they're biased against that issue. Everyone, you ask ten people, they're going to have ten stories. We have so much time in the day, we have to sort of decide what it is we're going to focus on. If I have to say that for me personally, there's not actually, from what I can see, a direct Canadian political connection to the climate gate story. So I'm not actually sure where I would have been expected to sort of leap into that right. one. If there is one, hey, send it along to me. But I'm not sort of, you know, global email climate environment reporter at large. I sort of have to cover what's going on on, on the Hill. And I think journalists are always, I want to get to your sites of the week, but journalists always make decisions as to what's the most yeah. important story. You're calling it the greatest story of the 21st century. I, I, I mean, obviously, every journalist is going to make that decision. I want to get to your site of the week. Jeff, why don't we start with you? What's your site of the week? Well, I picked a site called the The Pundit's Guide. It's run by uh, some non uh, nonpartisan people, and really, it's a great site to uh, keep track of who is running uh, for all the parties and all of the writings across across Canada. They track the nominations. Um, they also have uh, very good uh, analysis and data each quarter on the party financing, the fundraising, as well as uh, the uh, spending reports. Uh, during the elections, a very good analysis. And uh, what I like, uh, we were talking before about making the raw information available. They have all the raw data there so that you can drill down. All right, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, Jeff's, Jeff Jedris on that, your side of the week. What about you, Adrian? Uh, well, right now what's going on is there's uh, Canadian Blogger Awards. So uh, it's, it's quite exciting every year. Uh, People decide which they think are the great, uh, greatest blogs in Canada. It's, it can be all sorts of different sites, political, uh, nonpartisan, um, knitting. So it's, there's a wide array of uh, sites to look at. It's a great way to get into blogging and to look at, at blogs. All right, thanks, so, uh, Canadian Blog Awards.ca.
Canadian Blog Awards. Dottie, how about you, Katie? Side of the week. I'm sticking with the theme. I'm going with WikiLeaks.org, which has been described as the uh, virtual brown envelope for the entire planet. It just takes in, if you've got a document that you want to leak, you put it up there and they will add it, they will protect your privacy, and they'll make it available to the world. Adrian McNair, uh, Jeff Jedris, Katie O'Malley, thanks so much for being in today. Thanks. Thank you, Evan.